name is Apostolos Belokas. I'm the founder and managing editor of Safe for Sea. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, very <coughs> specialized event. We are teaming up uh, forces with the uh, <coughs> Megabox Working Group to present this event today. And we have uh, <coughs> organized this on a set of three panels plus one tabletop exercise. We expect, I, I know and we know it's a busy week for you. There are a number of events going on at the same time in other things as well. We understand that. That's why we have, let's say, minimized the time for the event. We expect to have the events completed uh, at approximately one uh, quarter past one, something like that. So you will be free to leave and go to <coughs> any other, uh, let's say, uh, events you, you may wish. So. <coughs> We have set this as a set of three panels with presentations, with, sorry, with uh, discussion. There will be no presentations. We expect this to be a little bit more interactive. We we'll start with the first panel, the second and the third, and then we'll have a tabletop exercise. During the panels, we, we can have the panelists saying something like an introductory statement, let's say, that's okay, that's expected. We can have discussion, and of course, questions will be open to the floor. So there will be enough time to interact, and of course, it's up to the moderators to, to engage with the, with the audience. So we expect that this is, a, this is an ongoing uh, work with a mega box uh, working group. And this is, the, let's say, the next step. We feel it's the next step to make it a much more, let's say, formalized platform to, to exchange ideas and for the dialogue, the ongoing dialogue. So uh, I would like to thank all our sponsors. You see all our sponsors, uh, some uh, roll-ups here and you see the sponsors, we have uh, these uh, 12 sponsors, we'd like to thank them all for this uh, support to this event. Without them we wouldn't have uh, this event, because it's, it's a free event to attend. And uh, without uh, further ado, I would like to ask um, <coughs> Maurizio and Olivier to come to the podium to welcome from their behalf before we commence the first panel. Go ahead, you, you go first. I mean, well, I'll go first, no worries. Uh, this for us is a, it's an important day, it's an important event. Um, we, um, as Apostolo said, um, we want to thank everybody, especially Safety for C for helping us put this together. We've been working together sort of a bit in the dark, behind the scenes, quietly as a working group, uh, totally pro bono, on a uh, people dedicating a lot of time, a lot of expense, for several years now. And this is the first time that we're out, let's say, coming out publicly to share some of our thoughts, findings, and, and ideas. And we want this to be the beginning of many more. I thank CMA for, uh, for the support and all this. We've been working together. Um, and many, all of the members, uh, the clubs, uh, and, and all the members that you will meet uh, later today, for their support. It's been several years. Sometimes we got tired. But uh, here we are, and I think uh, there's more to do, and this is why we are here today. Yes, I'm proud to be here today. So I'm Olivier Texier from CIMA CGM. I'm the Vice President for Safety and Security Department. And uh, thank you, Mauricio, to invite me for, for this, uh, to, for this uh, meeting. So as you know, I'm very concerned by the different topics today. Uh, the company, not only CIMA CGM, companies, carriers, faced many events during last months last year, uh, mainly fire, fire from cargo, so maybe we can have many discussions around this topic during the day. And uh, okay, also uh, I am, uh, for any discussion, I'm uh, free for you, all, all during the day. Perfect. As Apostle says, we want to make this very interactive, it's a relatively small group, don't be shy, ask questions, uh, engage uh, the panels and the moderators. Uh, the more we discuss, the better. Uh, we were born with a mouth. Uh, to speak, and we don't do enough of that in the industry. We were not meant to be communicating with our fingers, which is what we do now with phones and, and email. Uh, we should be talking more. And I think we talk a lot about loss prevention, we talk a lot about training, and, uh, but we don't do enough talking. And uh, this is the purpose today, is to talk and discuss things and learn from each other. Okay? 
Thank you very much. Thanks both of you for being uh, brief. That's one of the, I would say, one of the best aspects of timekeeping. Um, now, we would like to make it a little bit interactive. So I will start right away. The first question to the panelists in this panel, the first one, we will be talking about the key challenges. What is the problem and the challenges and risks? So I would like to ask my first question to the panelists, and you may have, let's say, three to five minutes to maybe read your notes or something within the uh, agenda of the panel. And my first question is, from your perspective, what are the key challenges that the mega box, uh, let's say, industry is facing, the mega box, let's say, operators are facing? What are the key challenges? I will start with uh, Tom. Yes, good morning, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, obviously, sorry. Um, Yes, uh, just uh, quickly to introduce uh, who I am, Tom Sommerberg. I'm working for Peter Döhle. Uh, we are sponsoring this as Döhle Havarie Contour, which is a correspondent of six PI clubs. But uh, in the Megabox store, we, are, we have joined as Peter Döhle Schifffahrts as a, as a tonnage provider, uh, mainly container vessels. We also have some bike, bike vessels and uh, NPPs. Um, so that's why I was asked to be here. Uh, as we have joined the Megabox Forum many years ago and participating uh, hopefully every time we have a meeting. Um, yes, um, so the question is, what are the crucial uh, aspects for us or, or um, issues when we come to these problems of fire, container fires? And for us as a, as a ship owner, um, the, the strange situation is that we, as a tonnage provider, as an asset asset holder, we have the least information about what's being carried on, on our ships. Um, if you look from the outside, that's maybe rather strange. If you're working shipping, it's all understandable, but if you are not working shipping and you ask a ship owner, what do you actually carry on your vessel when you go from A to B and you, know, you say, I don't even know, uh, there are like 5,000, 6,000, 8,000 boxes or 1,000 boxes on your ship, and what's in there? inside of these boxes, you say, I have to ask my charter. And then you go to your charter and he says, yeah, yeah, I can get you the contents of the car of the containers tomorrow. It takes some time. I have to ask all the planners. Maybe then I send you the bubbly file. Uh, but uh, I can't give you everything because we have three, four more slot charter, uh, slot partners on this ship. And we don't know what they carry for commercial reasons, obviously. And, and we do understand as a tonnage provider that there are a lot of commercial as aspects, but um, the, if when a casualty occurs uh, in the fire, to put it simply, there must be an overriding authority, there must be a trigger that we as a, as a ship owner who are then, of course, in direct communication with the crew, know what kind of risk they are tackling. We had just recently a fire on a rather big container vessel um, called the Polar Peru, and there was charcoal on fire. That's a 2018 built, uh, 3,800 <coughs> vessel. And only because the charter of this ship, and I, I, I don't mind main, naming them because they did, did a very good job, Smear's line, together with uh, Dürle, we achieved to, to uh, keep this fire quickly under control. Uh, we couldn't extinguish it because of the nature of the charcoal fire, but when we found out what's around these containers, stored in there, uh, it took us some time to do so. Sorry, it took us some time to do so. And there were some nasty surprises uh, when, we, when we got the information. So it's all about speed and accuracy of the information. And without that, we as a ship owner, we are lost. And, and at the end of the day, actually the crew is lost. Um, so we need to have a very good cooperation among charters and ship owners. That's for me for the moment, maybe. That is enough. Okay. Captain John. Good morning, all. Um, thank you very much, Neil Pastors, for allowing us to be here. My name is John Dolan. I'm Deputy Director of Last Prevention at the Standard PI Club. I've um, been with the club for four years, but prior to that I was a career ship manager mariner. So I'm coming from both camps. 
Um, in reply to the question, what are the principal concerns? Well, clearly, as an insurer, we have a great, great interest in uh, the safe management of uh, megabox ships, container ship, all shipping generally, container vessels specifically, and the megabox ships is one of particular, particular concern. It, it represents an elevated risk for insurers, a clustered risk, and therefore we are keen to share uh, the information that we have, but learn as well from forums and discussions like this. Specifically, we have, of course, scale, technology, crewing, um, ship operations, uh, the, the transportation chain generally, and the booking process. All of those sub-elements of safe international transport is of critical interest to us, and we're, I'm hoping to learn a great deal more from you guys today during this discussion. Thank you. Okay. Zim? <coughs> right, I'm Jim Allsworth. Uh, I'm a uh, salvage lawyer. Um, I work for a company called uh, Sea Solutions, uh, although now I now live in Greece uh, with our new company called Transport Councillors International. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, deal uh, more generally with the uh, legal insurance aspects that we're going to discuss shortly, uh, but uh, I think Tom has, has hit the nail on the head in terms of, uh, in terms of the uh, supply chain. Uh, cargo declaration issues are the most important and they fall through into the legal insurance issues uh, in terms of finding ways in which we can speed up the, uh, the provision of security and, and the provision of dealing with these cargoes um, during a, a salvage service. So I think information is the key. Information has been the key in, in most of these things. Uh, Tom is absolutely right, and, and getting information on the cargo, mm, Tom's more interested in what it is, and what the danger it proposes to, to his crew uh, from the insurance and the legal aspect, we're more interested in what it's worth uh, and who insures it, and that's the, uh, that's the aspect that I'll, I'll discuss in more detail uh, shortly. Okay, Costas? Very positive thinking. <laughs> From our side, as an insurer, a task side, we uh, will not so much into the key problems being the technical problems and how to resolve the fires and all that, but unfortunately, accidents do happen, and once they happen, how to best resolve uh, the situation and make sure that. Claim claims for let's say financial difficulty that the owner is going into and all other properties, uh, also cargo, they wish to be claimed in sacrifice damages. How all this is best done in the most efficient, optimized way so that uh, what we've seen in the, in the mega box ships and the big ships, container ships in general, is there is the, the key problem that is the our side is to get, the challenge is to get all the information, as much information as we can, to streamline the lines of communication and to make sure that there is transparency throughout so that we can deal with the casualty from uh, sets. Uh, these are the key challenges of, from, from our side at least. Okay, I would like to ask a brief question. Uh, Tom started out hitting the, head, the, uh, you know, uh, the nail on the head. Besides container ship fires, if we exclude container ship fires, is there anything else that should worry us? Besides container ship, we'll come to the container ship fires. So if we exclude container ship fires, do we have anything else to worry about? Tom. So, so, in which sense now? Uh, not container ship fires, but. Yes, I mean, I'm excluding. We will come to the container yes, ship yes, fires because you hit the head in the middle. Yeah. So, if we exclude container ship fires, do we have anything else we should be worried about? Worried. Worried about in respect of casualties, ship casualties. In, um, I, guess, I, I think you can always sense now with only four of, of the industry speakers that. 
we, we, we speak about the same, but we all have a totally different viewpoint on it. Correct. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if we work on the casualty, it's, it's, we are lucky if we work together during the casualty. And we all walk in the same direction during the casualty. But as soon as the casualty, if, as soon as the ship has uh, found its safe heaven, we start fighting bitterly about sometimes peanuts. And there are not a lot of people out, out there who are they're all very, very well trained, they've studied, they have brilliant degrees or experience, lifetime experience in shipping, and we still fight for peanuts compared with the overall value of what's, what's been shipped over the oceans. Um, and it frustrates sometimes if you, if, you, if you can't then at least sometimes prevail common sense and find a quick solution if we, how much money and time is lost by, by not coming, um, sitting at a round table as we do here and listen to each other, uh, but then just get out the legal textbooks and, and, and you know, especially what comes to general average, to make a little bit more now <coughs> concrete what I'm saying, not being too uh -huh. So, you know, if it comes to general average, the difficulty is now to get a GA through from A to Z. Uh, the, 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 the lifetime is, uh, the lifespan is like maybe 10 years, because you argue about so many different legal points and, and, and uh, aspects of seaworthiness and, and all this. You, you, Sometimes you, you, who's going to have the over, overview? Uh, the overview at the end. Uh, it's so difficult, and I think too much time and and money is wasted in in, in bringing to a casualty to a to a good end uh, later on on the paper with, when you crunch numbers. Yeah, uh, I understand people have to make a living, but so there must be a, somewhere. Uh, a better uh, way to come to a to a to an end. Okay, John. What? From your from your perspective, if we exclude fires, if excluding fires, and, and I put my former my my former life on on, on uh, in, into play here as a ship manager, these vessels, these are mega box ship vessels, are highly optimized vessels. Um, they are part of a chain where they, they service and provide a transportation function for an economic demand that is predicated on cost leadership. The person who can transport the most box at the least cost is the person who wins the game. And, and that pressurizes, I think, the, the ship operation function. I'm talking now about uh, vessels that are have uh, perhaps underpowered, perhaps uh, they're optimized for, for a very efficient uh, uh, passage, but not necessarily safe as when they enter into narrow channels. Uh, I'm thinking about the two Chinese Costco vessels that went aground in the Schell. Um, maneuverability is, is a concern with these vessels. Um, crew competence uh, to manage these vessels safely. Um, highly complex vessels, technologically advanced vessels now, to the point where is the complexity on board defeating the crew's ability to be able to respond and fault find in a timely manner to rescue situation? Of course, then it all opens up into the risk of fires and the technology that's available to firefight. So there are a lot of operational aspects with these vessels that I would say remain to be resolved. Okay. Uh, Jim? I'm a lawyer, so I'm normally fighting after over peanuts. That's where I make my living. Um, <laughs> joking apart. Um, the fight is over money at the end of the day. Um, so the only way to, 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 to stop that fight uh, is, to, uh, is, 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 to, is to change the way the money works. Uh, and although Costas will tell you a great deal of these cargoes are uninsured, at the end of the, end of the day, mostly the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, spread of the insurance is where the fight comes from. Because it's, it's only really one insurance company fighting over the other, or the ship owner trying to get his money back. Um, 
So if you want to reduce the amount of, uh, of fighting, we've got to have a fundamental change in the way the insurance is set up. A apart from that, though, the non-fire issues from a legal perspective, uh, I think, are, uh, are um, firstly the ports of refuge, where you take these megabox vessels to. Uh, you've got to remember that it is going to take time to deal with issues of general average security, salvage security. Uh, a large number of the boxes are going to provide security quite quickly. Some of the big insurance companies, cargo insurance companies, are, are well versed in that. Costas in particular is well versed in that. He can get quite a lot of insurance quite quickly for a big number of cargoes. Uh, they're then stuck if, if that cargo can't be picked out and individually transported uh, onto destination. One of the big problems we saw recently in the Yantai Express was the inability to discharge the cargo, store it in a way that, that it could be identified so the cargo that had provided security could be moved on to destination quickly. If the cargo is all stored on the ship and the ship can't sail on to destination until the last piece of cargo has provided its security, uh, then, then everybody else is delayed. So from, from an operational point of view on the legal side, uh, same, same question, same, same answer, information, what the cargo is, what the value is, where it's insured, if it is insured, uh, and from a technology point of view, where can you take the vessel that this cargo can be sorted? We could be talking about 23,000 boxes. And there aren't very many ports where we can discharge a container ship that's got 23,000 boxes on, spread the cargo out, pick out the ones that have provided security or aren't damaged and can be safely and quickly transported onto destination, their final destination. That's the problem. The other problem, obviously, non-fire, is just the sheer size of these vessels. So that if there is a grounding, uh, if, 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 uh, if there's a grounding or a collision, if cargo has to be discharged, if the vessel is listed, uh, getting the cargo off of a listed container ship uh, is very difficult because once, uh, once she's got a list it's very difficult to release the cargo and having the ability and the, the craneage, the pure size required to have the height and the outreach to discharge containers from the top of one of these ships but there's not very much around the world and I can guarantee you these things don't run aground right where you want them to, where you have a great big crane that's got the ability to, uh, to, to remove it. So those are the non-fire issues from, from my point of view.
forwarding of the cargo or of arrangements being made of secure cargo, and there is movement of the cargo, then we end up with a much better result overall uh, when it comes to cost. Uh, coordination of security, I can say, we say all the cases done in, in the chart of fires or whatever, two, three months, you will get 95% of the, the security. On the mega box ship, I expect, because of the size of the ship and where further destinations may be, you can go maximum to four months. But if you be four months, you will get 95% of security, and then the timeline will be, let's say, the uh, next six months, you will get the rest, if any, or at least it will be sorted out in any way by the same options or whatever. Uh, the, the, the GA, the general average, provides for people to feel comfortable enough to take initiative, to take measures, to pay for expenses, to pay for sacrifices, uh, to be dealt with. Because they have the reassurance through the contract of framework that they will get their money back from the rest of the parties involved. And we should not forget that because the, the reason of, of this thinking is that uh, if you know you will get your money back, be like hopefully more than 10 years, but uh, a lot less. Uh, uh, we see cases that we collected the security in three months. Uh, it took the salvage lawyers to agree the, the, the salvage allows on a year and a half later. And then within two, two months, we issued the GA adjustment. So the idea is for people to feel the comfort to take the initiative for high insurance also to uh, take the opportunity to uh, feel the comfort that I can assist you know, I understand myself the region how to have somehow opted <coughs> not to see on this panel of the insurance to see for the next one uh, being proactive insurer he wants to deal with the uh, human element and the insurance side of it but for them to go out of pocket for any insurer we saw the media notion that the people are going to be. Uh, there has to be a mechanism by which a robust mechanism, proven in time, that you can uh, resource to get a goal and your money. And without that, without uh, the GA uh, arrangements uh, through the contract of the and ship operators, owners, uh, slow charters, uh, they will not be able to get them. And there is a lot of things which fall outside the top, but come with discussions, especially coming from the part of the fellowship, but all of that. Uh, if you don't collect the security, uh, which also includes something for this, then uh, you might be exposed, you might come home if you advance these expenses. So there is a, a valid point to consider here that any party cooperating and taking initiative uh, should not bear it at all. Anything that is spent for the good of all must be contributed by all. And this is the basic principle of general language. <coughs> Maybe I'm biased, but uh, if anyone knows of any other way to split a 30 million years, then we know. Okay, I have another question for the panelists because I said if we exclude the fires, there are two cases, famous cases. One is the case of RIMA, the other is the case of ML Comfort. The case of RIMA, a large container ship may carry thousands of tons of fuel. So in a, in a case of a grounding, let's say, fuel oil could be a huge problem, huge problem, especially in a sensitive area. That's one issue. And the other issue is the ML Comfort, a very rare case, I would say. We have a container ship built by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, a first class maker built by and classed by NK, one of the best classification societies, operated by MOL, uh, which is one of the best ship operators in the world, split in two in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Should these cases be considered, let's say, the rare exception, or should these cases worry us? Because these both cases have, you know, the root causes of these problems are existent over there. Should these things worry us? Or should we consider it to be, you know, something that it happens one in a thousand or something? What do you think? Because you haven't mentioned, I said, if we exclude the fires, 
We exclude the fire, there's no fire here, okay? Should these cases worry us? We're talking about megabox ships, the ships are getting, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger. We have to face challenges. What do you think, Tom? Well, yes, uh, two casualties have, have not been involved. Um, difficult to talk about, but um, uh, yes, um, of course, every casualty should worry us and we should look behind them and find the root cause. Uh, if, if we stop earlier than discovering the root cause, we can never make sure it will not happen on our business. Uh, classification society, I think I have to be careful what I'm saying now. We should not just rely on, on classification society approvals. We have so many, I uh, think we all heard uh, about so many, uh, uh, some um, prob problems. Uh, let's mention the old automatic twist locks, which due to them not being properly working uh, some years ago, a lot of containers have been lost because the automatic twist lock from a particular manufacturer did not really work properly, and they were all classified by, uh, they all had a stamp from the classification society, they were all tested and approved. And this goes, you know, it starts there with leisure material, and it surely doesn't stop there. So, if, you, if you're an operator of, of, of these vessels, and they get bigger and bigger, you have to ask yourself, what do you have to invest to make them safer? And where is the where is the the the, the, the end reached? The and what can technology really yeah. provide? And we have these discussions now where I think some people, politicians, or some I think in Germany also ask for a top uh, of a of a um, of a um, ceiling for the size of the container vessels. I think it was t twenty three thousand to you. I don't know where they come up with this figure. Um, so yeah, of course, if, any, if, if within the dual group, we look at the root cause. Otherwise, we can't um, get better. Um, and, um, um, and then you, you can find, you can ask yourself, it's, it's just saying crew negligence, which is 80% or oh, human error, 80% of, of the causation of, of most casualties. Is that really where it comes down to? I mean, um, uh, is, our, is, a, is a technical failure, what, what has triggered a technical failure? And so you have to go more and more into detail and um, you can't just continue if you have a, the two, the arena and the MFL comfort. Uh, but this, I think, is true for every, every casualty. Whether you know, it's, a, it's a ferry sinking or a, a rural carrier capsizing, a bike carrier, yeah, again, maybe sinking because of liquefying surfaces, you have to find out. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, John. Uh, I would endorse what uh, Thomas said there, that it's the necess necessity to go back and look very carefully at every casualty, but specifically the two you mentioned, uh, like Tom, I'm not familiar with the base details of them. I understand that the arena was primarily a crew error, that there was, but you can then translate that into commercial pressure, the, the belief by the captain that he had to get from A to B as fast I'm as just, possible. Sorry, I'm just mentioning, for example, I'm just mentioning the arena. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested to go into details with what exactly happened. Right. The point is, you have a, a grounding, you have a ship, you know, carrying thousands of fuel, mm -hmm. you know. That would be an issue if you are in the wrong part of the world. That would be, if this incident happened anywhere else, most probably, it would be such a huge case. If we go now, if we go to the public opinion and ask, what type of ship was this arena? They're going to say to us, it was a, an old tanker. Correct. This is what they're going to say to us. It's a huge problem for the industry. There is no doubt there the perception of, of we, we get a bad press. So we, that's been a long, long problem in the business. Um, uh, you're correct about the arena. It there, there illustrates a great point, what Costas was making as well, that a very, very dramatic, public, visible casualty that was avoidable and now presents a, a huge challenge to salvage. And, uh, and so it did. It was nigh and impossible for you know, long, long periods to yeah. move any boxes. That's, that's the reason why we're here today, is to try our very, very best to come up with, from my perspective, to prevent these accidents. But if and when they do happen, that we have 
a response capability to minimize the, the losses, and there will be huge losses. And then, of course, as you say, pollution, well, you know, we get such a bad press, but when, when hundreds of thousands of tons of fuel oil are spilled, well, then we probably deserve it as well. So there are, there are aspects of, of all casualties that, that uh, should guide us on a daily basis in our work. Okay. Uh, Jim? Well, there's not a lot more to add. I think the, fa the fact of the matter is, of course, we should look at every casualty. Of course, we should be looking at ways uh, of loss prevention, of, of trying to prevent casualties. At the end of the day, shit happens. That's why we have insurance. Uh, the, the, the bigger the ship is, the, the more fuel it's likely to carry. That's going to change slightly. You know, technology is going to come through that enables us to have uh, a more efficient uh, type of uh, fuels. Uh, but all of the big ships, whether it's a mega box container ship or a big tanker, is going to have large quantities of fuel on board. If it runs aground, it's going to spill that. At the end of the day, there's also a, an argument for, uh, for education outside of the shipping industry. Uh, every penny that it costs to transport uh, goods from A to B, at the end of the day, goes on to the cost of the goods, which goes on to the cost of the consumer. Uh, we do get a bad press. Uh, I don't think we deserve it. Uh, three months ago, I was uh, in Shanghai in a, on a collision case. Uh, when I got to the, uh, to, to the uh, unladen in ballast, uh, very large bulk carrier that I was dealing with, uh, I had to climb up a, a pilot ladder that was, uh, that was nearly 27 meters uh, long to get on board. I can't get someone to fit a, uh, a satellite television aerial on my roof without three guys being there and scaffolding being put up. Uh, but uh, in the shipping industry, that's just uh, ignored. So there needs to be an education. At the end of the day, costs are passed on to the end user. If they really thought about it, they would probably be less worried. But it's going to happen. We've got to learn from it. We've got to try and what, find ways to prevent it. We're never going to stop it. It's going to happen one, at some point. OK. Costas? I think it's quite interesting. We're, we're always complaining that uh, our industry is getting bad press and that uh, legislation is being forced for us. But uh, the problem is the reason that happens is because we don't do enough self regulate And unfortunately, the accidents happen and then the collisions get involved. And everyone then is putting whatever legislation they think of on us just because they have to do something. So maybe if we regulate ourselves a little better, and maybe if we are a bit proactive on that sense, then there will be less stuff pushed on us. Now that the mega ships carry a lot of bunkers, that can also be, as a positive person, I always think of positive things to say, can only be a good thing because uh, you can refloat very easily because the ballast arrangements of these ships are not really uh, there. So if you carry a lot of fuel, we have refloated uh, cases where well, we flow the ships by getting the bunkers off and uh, kept the uh, lighter of the ship to a minimum and uh, that worked out quite well. So I mean, people cannot expect uh, things to be moved around the world and uh, it takes <coughs> time being we're using internal combustion engines and they burn fuel and that's how it is. It's we expect ships to bike and in Speaking about fuels, I would just like to, to add one small comment. If you have a ship carrying, let's say, LNG as a fuel, compared with a ship carrying fuel oil, you know, this diesel as a fuel, that would be a totally different case. Because if you have LNG spilled into the air, it would be a totally different case. There wouldn't be no visible pollution. Visible pollution. So that would be a totally different case. That's just a, just a quick point, because that's, that's a, it's not a joke. But as you said, maybe, maybe. Now, my next point, you, you touched upon my next question about regulation and about legislation. My question is, do we have the adequate legislation or do we have enough self-regulation? It depends on, on which side of the fence you are. I'm talking about a, a good example of the cruise line industry, for example. When there was an accident of Costa Concordia, the industry came together and developed a set of you know, self-regulation guidelines that implemented by all um, operators within the cruise line uh, industry association. That's, uh, I think, an industry best case example, let's say. 
Do we need more self-regulation for these large container ships? Do we have enough or adequate legislation? Do we have an adequate solace? Do we have an adequate IMDG? So it's up to you. Do we need to do something about regulation? Either regulate ourselves or push forward for the industry to regulate properly. For example, the case of uh, the misdeclaration of cargo, maybe. So, Tom, what do you think? I mean, the, the, the start, one of the start was made, but I think a good thing, uh, introduction was the implementation of the VGM. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I, I don't know if I can't prove it now with figures, but at least uh, since it was implemented, or before it was implemented, I, I expected many problems and many calls from the captains of our ships asking uh, where the VGMs are, but uh, have, we have no inquiries from the ship, so this must work quite well. Whether the figures are correct or, or not, I, I can't say. But um, I think that was a good, good step, in the right, uh, step in the right direction. Uh, again, uh, in theory, yes, of course, it would be great if, if uh, uh, a major s a step in the right direction if we know what's inside the uh, containers and if we can rely on it. But, but you know, people are uh, people around who are uh, uh, not uh, uh, gentlemen. You know, they, they like to cut corners and they like to tell you that I don't know some stuff in there, but they actually carry uh, some dangerous cargo uh, just to save money, or they use the wrong type of a container just to save money. If a law can uh, uh, stop that, I mean, there are a lot of laws out there and. Still, uh, people don't don't follow it. It's, I mean, it's difficult, really. Um, again, I would say the industry has to look. The shipping industry have to question themselves sometimes and and um, try to find also solution internal inter in, in, within the industry. Like we try with the mega box, like we try with the uh, CSSF, the uh, Container Ship Safety Forum. Uh, Olivier, you are definitely a, a, a CMA is a member, uh, and many other container operators are a member, Dula as well. I think we are, Olivier, covering already 40%. What, what are the figures? I, I, I can't say. A uh, high number of container, yeah, 40% of the, of the actual uh, container fleet worldwide. And we have also several meetings to f uh, every year to, to come, we come together and we discuss it. And uh, the CSSF, uh, um, wants to, as, a, as an NGO, wants to have an impact on, on the industry to make uh, container ships safer. Um, but also, um, we have to look at, at the crew uh, and see what we can do there. Do we need new laws? Uh, do we have to uh, uh, ask the politicians to do that for us? I mean, we know now, before the uh, internet, the crew came on board and uh, they were away from home and they could only care, or had to care about the ship. Uh, and home was taken care of by the wife. Uh, these days, uh, the wife calls the AB, or the ordinary seaman, or the first mate, or sends him an email and says, I have this problem at home with my children. Can you please do something about it? I have a problem with school. Can you do this? I have financial problems. Can you do this? So the, the sailor is not anymore only on board taking care of the ship. He also takes care of the family, so there's much more pressure on the individual crew member. A and another huge factor when it comes to casualty, how can we regulate this? Can we forbid them to read their emails uh, only twice a month, maybe, or only nice emails? I, I don't know. You know um, so, uh, with, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Um, it's good, I think, uh, <laughs> for you, Jim. Uh, so I really can't. Um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, of course, you know, casualties normally bring about better regulations. You know, solars after after the Titanic blow, and, and so on and so on. But um, do we have to ask for it? I think we have to ask ourselves: What can we do uh, within the industry, knowing that a container vessel is a small tanker, and if if our ship the ground grounds and spills the oil. We are in the media, big time these days. Media attention is everywhere. Uh, you know, it's not only the Costa Concordia anymore. You find on the main news, 
small incidents and casualties will be on the main news. Piracy incidents will be on the main news. You know, uh, ML of comfort was on the main news, so we can't just hide anymore. So we have to find solutions. Okay. Also, yeah. John? <clears throat> it, it really is a very difficult question. Um, to legislate or not is, is very difficult. Of course, every industry would like to be self-regulating. I'm just sorry. I'd just like to also point out another case. We have the, in, the tanker section, the tanker sector, when the majors have taken care of, of the, let's say, the industry, introducing TMSA, for example. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they said, this is what we want from the industry, and this is what we have to do. But after Exxon Valdez? It was not after Exxon Valdez, it was actually after Erika. It was after the after Erika. But the point is, correctly as you said, instead of fighting with each other, you, f you find a number of interests, let's say, taking forward their agenda, because the major said exactly that. In order to minimize the losses from our side on the next Erika, why not introduce TMSA beforehand? I'm just saying, We've seen other cases, like for example the industry uh, of the tankers, let's say the cruise lines, and we've seen these taking care of themselves with, let's say, proper self-regulation. This is what I would like to point out. I know it's a difficult question. There are no white and black. There are a lot of gray here. I'm just interested for your views. That's, that's all. But, well, j just on the point, in my former career I was one of the very early sire inspectors on the tanker side. And, of course, TMSA is a relatively easy initiative to introduce when you have seven big oil majors Correct. who dominate the market and who can impose Fully. these solutions. On a much more fragmented market, yeah. where you have equal numbers of uh, charters, and this, is, this is Tom's there now, I wouldn't be the expert here, where it's more balanced, it is very difficult then to introduce such an initiative because, no doubt, TMSA program on the tanker side imposes a huge cost yes. on, on tanker operators. Okay. So um, to legislate or not to legislate, um, I think um, the numbers being quoted in the insurance industry, if you take an 18,000 TU uh, vessel, I'm hearing that it's about 10% of the cargo on board would be DG. And of that 10%, 1,800 vessels, of that 1,800, about one third is misdeclared or undeclared. So we're talking about 600 boxes potentially on an 18,000 TU every voyage, which is a problem. Now, if I, I'm quite sure I work with some very clever actuaries, but the statistics associated with having 18 uh, or 600 boxes undeclared or misdeclared on board is simply intolerable. So at some point there is going to be a pushback from the industry to have better enforcement of current regulation or we will get new regulation. It's got, it's got to be done. Yeah. Okay. Jim? Oh, regulations. Um, the trouble is with all regulations is that there's a wide variety of interests and uh, each interest will push for regulations that, uh, that benefit or, or, or are part of their own interest. So what you end up doing is get regulations or decisions made by ill-informed people who have their own best interests in heart and we then get a situation where we have Brexit or to not to offend my American <coughs> friends, not to offend my American friends, President Trump. <laughs> so. Regulation is a, is, is, a difficult, uh, is, is a difficult subject. Self-regulation would be good, but uh, as, as John and Tom said, the, is, the big issues uh, are, are, uh, are the, the way in which it's done. And even, even in a self-regulating industry, we have different interests. We have the insurance interest, we have the yes. ship's interest, we have the cargo interest, we have the charter's interest. So getting a regulation that A, everybody agrees with, and B actually thinks about the long-term consequences. Regulations are easy. We are a reactive industry. Shipping is a reactive industry. Uh, you know, we only get so less after we have a massive uh, loss of life. We only get uh, uh, we only get Marpol after we have a massive fuel. We only get OPA 90 after we have a massive tanker loss. Um, so shipping industry is reactive, it's not proactive, uh, maybe it could be more proactive. 
Uh, the difficulty is, it's like everything else, thinking of every possible uh, uh, scenario and how to regulate to overcome it is just impossible. Uh, and just on the MOL comfort, uh, uh, very briefly, uh, I suspect most people breathed a sigh of relief when she sank, because dealing with her when she was afloat would have been a really difficult, complicated thing to do. I think the point is not to, let's say, declare that we will not see a fire, but we would not see a fire, let's say, due to misdeclared cargo, let's say. That's the case. Because a fire may happen for a number of reasons. This is what it is, because this is what it is. So it's time right now for a brainstorming session. <clears throat> Tom started from his initial statement. He said about the misdeclared cargo, I would like to hear from you. What is the best way to fight misdeclared cargo? Easy question. I would like to hear from you. What's Maurizio? Don't stare, don't stare at me. So don't try to avoid the question. Eh? So what's the best way to fight misdeclared cargo? I'd like to hear from you, please. We have a, a microphone, two microphones. Yes. yes. Can we have a microphone over here? Well, yeah. OK. I just uh, add some comments about misdeclared cargo. There is some consequence. This is fire, but not only. This is the, it could be the weight, is VGM, right. but we don't ask about security. Sometimes this is for illegal traffic like drugs and so on. Correct. So at the end, to the problem is ashore once again, and maybe because we have to define before the container arrive on the terminal or on the ship. I ask about terminal because I'm responsible for some terminals also. And sometimes we have some fire or some explosion and some uh, traffic on, on the terminals. So we have to, to, to put in place some uh, screening system. This is a, we, we try to do this uh, in CMSGM and with other companies. So when the shipper uh, do the booking, we have a database, a huge database for sure, and we try to have some uh, words to find some anomaly inside this booking. It could be uh, the destination, it could be the port of loading, it could be the name of the shipper because uh, we have some uh, blacklist. Yes. This, this is records? Oh, okay. <laughs> so this, this is one means we can uh, have for the, for the company to, to prevent some, uh, some, uh, some events on board our vessel terminals. This is one point we, we try to take in place. But this is very difficult because uh, we need uh, all the database for the different partners. Because when you, you charge your vessels, you have some slot with partners. So for your booking, is so easy. But we have to share the information with others. So this is, it could be uh, global solutions, not only one company. This is not possible. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, it, you know, the cargo loading part of supply chain side is not my expertise, but I, you know, TNT ships containers, we mobilize to jobs and we 
have to fill out paperwork and do uh, commercial invoices and uh, packing lists. And sometimes, you know, we can't find the right code, so we just say, ah, just put it as that. Of course, our stuff is harmless for the most part. It's hard work, it's pump. <laughs> yeah, but we are, in a way, I've missed the clear card. I mean, it's harmless, but it, because I couldn't do it, couldn't find it. And the, and the sh freight forwarder said, just put that, it's okay, it'll, it'll encompass all of that. I think the problem, like Tom said, the problem is not the ships. And now we're talking about in, in increasing firefighting capacity in container ships and all that. Yeah, we can do that. But that's just a band-aid. The problem is from the dock backwards. All the way to Mauricio and family loading the container to move his furniture back to Peru. I mean, that's where it starts. And the whole supply chain, there's so many people involved. And every time that container is handled from one to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other, the, the, the commercial pressure is building because the ship's got to sail, so there's no time to review the paper. So I think the, the industry needs to look at that whole system and try to standardize it and see how it can be streamlined to minimize those uh, risk uh, gaps of misdeclaring, misfiling, make it easier, simpler, where you can catch the misdeclaration. Maybe a personal comment from here? Mauricio, you just got to make sure yeah. you don't ship on Don't you like to? Yeah, I just, uh, I just have a personal comment. As long as it's cheaper to ship used batteries from A to B than to dispose them in the home country, yeah. you will always have yeah. you know, old batteries, old tires. You know, I don't know, all this shit we ship from Germany also to Turkey and try to get rid of it there. Uh, it's going to be always difficult uh, to, to, to stop that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've seen the case of, uh, I think this is a case, a similar case. Yes, uh, hold on. And this is a similar case, the, the case of Probo Koala. It's not a case about batteries. It was a case about the contaminated uh, toxic uh, waste carried from uh, Amsterdam to uh, I don't remember, some, somewhere in the west coast of uh, Africa. Abidjan. Abidjan, mm -hmm. correct. And it was a huge case uh, 13 years ago, and it was a case involving the ship operator. There was a lot of bad reputation for the ship operator because they were carrying these uh, toxics w without knowing that. So, and the, the charter was Trafigura at that time, and it was a huge case. You can read about the case, for example, in Wikipedia now. Mm. So there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, bad reputation involved. So I'm just saying that. Yes. Where was the microphone? Yes. Yes, I fully agree with, with Olivier. This is, uh, of course, a short problem. But uh, to make matter worse, we are not talking uh, of undeclared cargo by, by criminal intent. We're also talking about the, the whole um, issue with, with DG classification, because the whole classification process um, there is no worldwide rule how to classification dangerous goods. So the maker of the dangerous goods are totally free how to classification. So, so he deciding on the UN number, he deciding on the class. So, um, and this could be, this is perfectly legal. Um, even though, so um, when we're talking about self-ignition cargo, polymerization cargo, so um, the maker of the, of the cargo can, can decide which UN number um, he, he would put it, and uh, this, is a, this is also a problem. That, that's a legislation issue. I'm just saying that's a, that's a legislation issue. Anyone else? Thank you. 
these are the cases that uh, we should be taking on the ship and that we'll be able to find and resolve and uh, bring to an end as quickly as possible with as less financial loss for everyone involved uh, as possible. Uh, so we can do whatever we do to minimize this, but the cases will still be there in the future as well. Okay, yes. I have just one comment more about DG. Uh, this is about regulations. So DG regulation is the IMDG code. There is some goods like batteries or uh, charcoal, as you say. Uh, the, the regulation, sometimes it's dangerous cargo, sometimes not. It depends on the packaging and so on. So this is not so clear. And the shipper or consignee use this to, uh, to issue some misdeclaration. And th at the end, the consequence was a leakage, was fire, was and so on. So maybe we have some action to do about this kind of regulation to clarify the strict classification for the, 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 the goods like batteries, charcoal, uh, other one. Absolutely. Anyone else? By the way, as we will be running out of time because the, the panel is expected to complete within the next three minutes, do we have any questions from the floor to the panelists? Any sort of questions from the floor to the panelists regarding, again, the agenda of the panel? which is the, the basic challenges that the industry is facing. Um, I'm not sure whether I should be asking uh, Jim or uh, uh, Mr. Dolan uh, <coughs> on the, what is the liability of the, of the shipper? When a ship is on fire due to a misdeclared container um, on board the vessel, insurance kicks in, Halle machinery, P&I would cover the losses how do the insurance companies subrogate against the, um, the misdeclared cargo? I mean, is there any action against those people who create the fires in the end? Or is just the insurance in the middle paying the bill? I'm not a lawyer here, so I'll happily, <laughs> happily give a hospital pass to Jimmy. <laughs> right. Um, well, at the end of the day, it depends on, on, on who's the interested party. From, from the ship owner's point of view, he's only, and, and his insurer, his Helen P&I, they're, they're interested in recovering their money. So, so the chances are on a container ship, they will, they will look to the charterer that put that cargo on board because that's the person they've got the, uh, they've got the contract with. So, uh, so what will happen from insurance practice is that uh, with, a, with a large container ship that's got a charterer and several slot charterers, uh, and, uh, and, and Clive will have, have, have seen this before. In fact, I remember standing on a, on a quay uh, following a, a burning container ship a few years ago with, with seven fire experts uh, watching the containers being uh, discharged and going, oh, that was the one because of the way the fire has spread. And then they identify which one caused the problem uh, and then it's that, that charterer, that slot charterer, and that slot charterer's insurance company that has the problem. Then they've got to look at where they go down the line, uh, line from, 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 from them. They all have even come to the pub to get over with. Yeah. You, you could have cases where you, you have clear liabilities here, where the lives, and in the cases that's why I set up confirmation, when we don't mention confirmation is very important. In other cases, in the chapter, he needed to assume responsibility to cover even part of the salvage of the operations and expenses. And
Okay. Do we have any other question from the floor? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Costa. Uh, first of all, yes, it, it is complicated, and usually there's a uh, quite complicated legal structure with slot charters and which way the claims have to go, and then down again. And so th that is complicated, as you say. Um, I think the recent case that comes to my mind where, uh, is the MSF Lamina, just yeah. come through the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court, I believe, uh, where liability was successfully put on the but he was the producer and the shipper uh, jointly. Um, if I may, I just had one note uh, to the uh, uh, comment uh, or the, 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 the question that was raised uh, if we disregard fire cases uh, and all other cases that we have uh, incidents on board a megabox ship. We have this year had uh, experienced both uh, fire on board megabox and uh, we had uh, fairly recently a, a grounding. Everything went well. Uh, no loss of life, uh, no pollution, uh, ship refloated quite fast, uh, cargo came off quite fast. But then you get into the complexity uh, that is just the sheer size of the vessel and the, uh, where the vessel is. Mm. Find a, a dock for a vessel of this size, tow her there, and then the costs of uh, getting parts, propellers, uh, shafts, and rudder uh, of this size. So we have, uh, <coughs> just as a note, uh, I think the most expensive case for the Norwegian Hull Club uh, this year is one uh, where there's not a fire, it's completely under the radar. Everything went well, but that's a, a, a grounding on a, on a, on a mega box vessel. I think I will leave it there for now, yeah. Okay. Do you have anyone else? Uh, Apostles, could yeah, I just yes. make one point as well? In relation to the industry response to this kind of, uh, you know, the undeclared, misdeclared cargoes, um, I just make a reference here to SINs, it's the cargo incident, the notification system. Um, this now is, has grown and grown and grown. And, and the last meeting, which was hosted here in London only a few months ago, 85% of all box capacity in the world was represented by the 45 or 50 people in the room. So there is an enormous amount of concern about this um, challenge. Jim, as far as I remember, from my, back from my, my school days, but international trade, if the foundation is trust. And if somebody sets out in, to subvert that system, then there's very, very little that the shipping industry can do right now. One of the responses has often been discussed is sharing of information. And that is a big, big problem. At SIN's level, there can be no sharing of commercial information, antitrust concerns for sure. But it is a tension because when safety is at stake, when uh, we talk with the Mersco Dam, when five people die on a vessel like that due to a, a, a fire on board, potentially misdeclared, we don't know quite sure, then there are bigger considerations than just pure commercial information. So the industry is struggling to find a way in which people who have tried to ship stuff undeclared and are discovered, how can that individual or that company be notified fairly and transparently in a way that would prevent them from doing it again. That is a problem. We haven't found a solution yet. The reality is, of course, you're never going to find a solution. It, when every time there is a regulation, every time there is a law, every time there, there are clever people who will try and find a loophole around it. But apart from the, apart from the environmental risk, which is obviously very important, and, and even more important, the health and safety risk of the crew and the ship, this is all about insurance at the end of the day. And, and at the end of the day, we, you know, we're talking about recoveries. We're talking about a hull underwriter trying to recover money from, uh, from, from another insurance company who may then try to, to, to recover it from another insurance company further down the line. And that's, that's the, the really, if, if to, to, to make a big difference to the mega box or, uh, in industry, is actually really a, a review of the way we, uh, we, we deal with the insurance. And uh, we may not get to the, the general average and security issue at the, at the bottom of the, the, this topic, but, but the, the simple fact is, is that um, the, 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 the best way to deal with most of the problems from the legal perspective, megabox problems from a legal perspective aren't any different from the legal problems on any other vessel. They're just 
ten times bigger yeah. uh, in terms of their sheer size. The best way to deal with most of the problems in terms of delay, in terms of getting things moving, and Costas isn't going to like that, it's just, this is, it's just change the way the insurance is done. The ISU total revenue last year was $400 million. The revenue they got from salvage, LOF salvage, was somewhere in the region of $100 million. Probably salvage generally because of a propensity to try and uh, to, to commercialise salvage would probably double that, probably about $200 million. That's the total revenue, gross revenue, from the International Salvage Union from salvage, probably in the region of $200 million. That's every single ship, every type of ship, every t uh, type of accident. The total number of containers shipped around the world each year, funnily enough, is close to about 200 million. And there must be a way of saying for one US dollar per box, so we're talking about a cost of shipping a container between two and a half, four thousand dollars per container, depending on where it's going. Okay, some are eight hundred dollars, some are more. By adding one US dollar, to the cost of shipping every container, we could have an insurance fund big enough to pay the entirety of the gross revenue of the International Salvage Union each year. That is a way of dealing with speeding up stuff. That is the way of getting cargo boxes onto destination. That is the way of stopping an accident on, in September, preventing the must-have Christmas gift uh, getting to its destination. Well, that is the way of stopping the container ship that is carrying 15% of the world's entire uh, 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 supply of a particular good from stopping that getting to destination. It's a complete review of the way we do this on the container ships. We don't have to change things in relation to the bulk carriers, in relation to the tankers, but in relation to container ships, we can have an insurer's position for one US dollar a box that could cover the entire salvage and general average cost for the entire year, uh, 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 which would mean we didn't have to worry about getting security. We don't have to worry about exercising salvage liens. So we don't have to worry that our, our container ship incident happened in, in Ecuador, uh, but the containers were going to Peru, and Peru doesn't understand or recognize it, salvage liens. So we cannot transship any of the cargo to destination because we cannot get security. It doesn't matter if we got that security already, and we could do that for a dollar a box. Yeah. Thank you. You've got to get all the lines in the world to charge one US dollar per box for the uh, for, for the extra, and have this, uh, this product, <laughs> these products are available. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It, uh, Pete Townsend, close friend of mine, has been trying to push this, uh, push, push a, a, a way of doing it, but it's just too complicated. It's, it's, it's the, way, the way Pete's idea of, of dealing with it is just too complicated. The biggest problem is values. Salvors, at the end of the day, they're treasure hunters. They won't accept that a $20,000 a box, uh, a $20, a box average is, is good because there might be gold in them, their hills. Uh, to, to quote Mark Quay. Insurance companies are the same. They won't agree because they think some of these cargoes aren't going to be worth $25,000. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's going to be done. I've been doing this since 1997. The cheapest case we ever have to buy new 
And this is, this, is, this is where I have to jump in because we are out of time. I would like to ask our audience to give our panelists a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>